Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jayatri Das, and I'm Chief Bioscientist at the Franklin Institute. Thank you all for joining me for another conversation around some of the science underneath the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and the other issues that we're, that we're looking at in, in our newspapers and, and online uh, um, these days. I wanna start by recognizing that today is a grassroots movement in the scientific community under the hashtag shutdown STEM. It's a day where it's intended for all of us to pause and reflect on the systemic racism that's been embedded in STEM institutions and plan action needed for change. Science has always shaped our society in ways that I think are more obvious than ever in the middle of a pandemic, whether it's through new ways of understanding the world or new technologies that transform our lives. But too often these ideas and these technologies have sacrificed the well-being of Black people and Black scientists. So like others in the STEM community today, our team is reflecting on how we think about science and education, the stories we tell and the voices that we celebrate. So it's a true privilege for me to be joined today by Dr. Lonnie Philip Tabb, a biostatistician at the Dornsife School of Public Health at Drexel University here in Philadelphia. We're gonna talk about how concepts of public health, um, some of these ideas that have hit the headlines lately because of COVID-19, can help us understand the health impacts of racism. And most relevant to the moment that we're in today, uh, her work proposes solutions to some of the, uh, the, the questions that we've been wrestling with and gives us some direction on how to focus our attention on supporting and improving the health of communities of color as we look to the future. So please, as usual, share your questions with us in the chat. Uh, we know that these are difficult topics to talk about and we're here to learn and make sense of it together. So Lonnie, welcome and thank you for joining us. <laughs> thank you. Uh, can you first tell us a little bit more about your role at Drexel? Sure, thank you so much for having me this afternoon. I am currently an associate professor of biostatistics at Drexel University within the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics. And it sits within the Dornsife School of Public Health. And I've been there now for 10 years. That's great. We've, and we've been lucky to have multiple opportunities to work with you while you've yes. been at Drexel. And so we're really grateful for your partnership as you know, we try and think about how some of these issues in science and health really relate to society and specifically the city of Philadelphia where, where we're located. Now, lately, it feels like everybody and their brother has become an armchair epidemiologist. <laughs> so can you first, you know, before we get into, you know, the lens that you bring to it, can you help us understand what biostatistics is and how you got interested in it? Sure. I get this question often. Biostatistics is the field of science that uses math and statistics to understand various health challenges within the fields of public health and in medicine and in biology. And when I was an undergraduate student at Drexel University, I initially majored in business, which is a far cry from biostatistics. And during my first co-op experience, I actually interned at the Vanguard Group, which is a mutual fund investment company in Pennsylvania. And it was during that time that I trained and I learned the ins and outs about mutual funds. And while it was interesting, it really wasn't my passion. And so after that first co-op experience, knowing that I had some interest in quantitative you know, fields, I switched my major to math. And I learned more and more about math theory and how math can be applied. And I became more interested in that path so that I could use it to solve a variety of different problems. And so I continued on there at Drexel in my graduate training to obtain my master's in math. And during that time, that's when I found out about the fields of biostatistics and how biostatisticians, as well as epidemiologists, combat these difficult health problems. And so I continued on in my training at Harvard University and that's where I obtained my PhD in biostatistics. Epidemiologists, they are those individuals who are on the side of science that try to make sense or understand the clinical and the social aspects of diseases and what factors right. play into those diseases. And so when you consider you know, our current pandemic related to the coronavirus, 
there are tons of epidemiologists, friends that I have, colleagues that I work with, they're working behind the scenes to understand the pathogenesis of this particular virus and how it differs from other viruses that we've been exposed to. But the biostatisticians like myself, we're also behind the scenes, but our job is more on the side of what the data actually means as it relates to this particular pandemic. So if you were to look at the number of cases in say the United States and how these numbers and counts of coronavirus cases differ in say blacks and Hispanics and how it compares to say whites, biostatisticians are there to test if those differences that we see, if they're random or like by chance or if they're a true difference. That's a really helpful explanation in the context of what we're all thinking about. And so we've got these epidemiologists that are really just kind of predicting you know, the, the, the spread of the disease based on some of the mathematical, mathematical models that we've talked about in you know, some of our previous conversations you know, in, this, in this Facebook Live update. But, um, but, you, but you really bring a different perspective to it, kind of taking the next step in terms of thinking, how do those numbers then translate to the real impact on people and communities? Exactly. Um, and, I, and I loved your story about how you came into this field, because I know, you know, I was a math nerd growing up too, but kids don't always get a sense of how math has real life applications um, in yes. ways that affect people's lives. Yes. So yes. thank you. So thank you for sharing that story. Yes, yeah, sure. So what, what brought me to this, um, this conversation today was, you know, of course, in the wake of the, the, the police violence at, uh, against black men and women that we've been looking at um, for the last years, but has really mm -hmm. come into sharp focus in the last two weeks. I've been seeing a lot of headlines about how different cities and towns around the US are talking about addressing racism as a public health issue. What does that mean, both in terms of you know, actual you know, policies as, you know, and, and then maybe what that means in terms of shifting our mindset about how we look at racism? Sure. First and foremost, I, I just want to thank you and the Franklin Institute for this opportunity to discuss what oftentimes people think are challenging topics and issues that plague our country but I urge your listeners to really consider why these conversations are often thought to be so difficult, right? Yeah. Is it because it reflects our country's history, our country's supposed pledge of allegiance, right? Which is supposed to stand um, in terms of one nation, indivisible with liberty and justice for all, right? But is it really for all? So for that, I do applaud the Franklin Institute for wanting to take a pause to listen and then move towards real change. Now, back to your, your question, I know for me, when I think about race, a lot of things run through my mind. I am a black woman, I'm married to a black man. I am raising with my husband two black children and one happens to be a boy. And so race to me, is not just simply the, the color of my skin. I believe that race is a construct and it's how people view you, it's how people treat you, it's how people determine whether or not to respect you. And for my eight and five-year-old children, it could be that determining factor as to whether a child plays with them. And it's unfortunate. And in public health, a construct like race has very strong ties to a laundry list of health and social outcomes that plague our country and around the world sometimes. And so being black in America, it can lead to unfortunately, poor health and, and social outcomes, poor cardiovascular health, poor mental health, poor socioeconomic standing, educational outcomes, and even poor access to clean running water, right? Right. So these are just a few examples of why race, but more specifically, racism is a public health crisis. Yeah, and, I, and I'm glad you, you start to define that distinction between race and racism, um, because we, we have so much evidence, so, so much scientific evidence that there's no biological basis for race. Mm -hmm. um, and yet it is a social construct that is inescapable. Um, and we have to think about it 
um, in, in terms of how it affects uh, people's lives, but it's racism mm -hmm. that, um, that is, is that then that, how that actually influences you know, people's interactions with the world around them and the people around them and the systems right. around them. Right. So I think that, that I'm, I'm glad you talked about that because I think that's an important distinction to make. Um, so if we think about all of the different layers um, how, of how racism affects health, you know, we can look at the individual level, we can look at the community level, we can look at systems. Um, that's a lot to talk about, but right. can, you, can you help us understand by breaking down um, what, you know, you as a statistician, what kind of factors do you look at at each of those levels? Right, this is, this is a great question. Um, when I think about racism and systems and structure, structures of oppression and how they impact the, the health of individuals and the communities that they live in, there are a lot of different factors at play. So at the individual level, I could easily focus on first someone's race or ethnicity, right? That's the obvious choice. But at that same individual level, there are a number of other factors at play. Socioeconomic factors, education, income, employment. But then when you also think about individuals, we're thinking about the communities that they live in, right? People work in communities, they learn in communities, they play in communities, and they worship in communities. And because of that, another obvious factor is what do these communities and neighborhoods actually look like? So do folks live in neighborhoods where they have access to fresh fruits and vegetables and overall healthy food options? Do they live in a neighborhood where they have access to clean outdoor space so that they can be physically active and have fun? Do they live in neighborhoods where they have access to, to clean drinking water? And if the answer is no, right, to any of these, then their health will not necessarily thrive. Right? right? So much of the work and research that I'm engaged in and of those before me that have looked at the impact of race and racism on different health outcomes can easily tie those outcomes to systemic policies and structures. And some of those policies and structures are rooted in racist values. So I'm gonna give you an example. Yeah. And this plays a lot into the work that I do um, and a lot of the work that I do with colleagues um, who happen to also be epidemiologists, right? When you think of housing in this country, we can't really ignore the, the laws that were put into place to push Blacks out of certain communities. And this was in an effort to create neighborhoods that have better schools, better jobs, parks, overall better amenities. And so this federal agency that was created, it was called the Homeowners Loan Corporation. It created what they deemed as residential security maps and they were created from major cities across the US. And so you had back then loan officers, appraisers and real estate agents that would evaluate lending risk in neighborhoods. And unfortunately, during this time, high risk neighborhoods were termed hazardous. And I'm putting air quotes up because when you think of the word hazardous, you should think of, well, does the neighborhood have, you know, cancer causing agents, right? That might be right. sticking up for the from the ground. That's hazardous, but no, that was not the case. The term hazardous here was used to describe black and minority neighborhoods. And That's so really, those very yeah. same neighborhoods were then redlined. It's a really and interesting use of language in how it, it frames our thinking about it. It is. And so when you think about, or at least when I think about racism, and how it is multi-level. It can be at the individual level, it can be at the neighborhood level, and all of those levels are impacting a lot of what we're seeing in terms of these disproportionate, unfortunate settings with respect to the health of the black and brown communities. Right, and we see that manifested in, in the disproportionate impact of COVID-19. Exactly. Um, which is an uh, we have another uh, we had another episode where we talk of of our updates where we talked about some of those disparities and right. um, and and based on some of the, the the work that we did with you around our giant heart exhibit um, right. to draw attention to the roots of those disparities um, right. along the lines that that, that you talked about. Um, I wanted to talk you know 
talk both about mental, the mental health and the physical health aspects of this, um, because they are interrelated. Um, but when we think about uh, mental health first, uh, we, you know, we've been talking about sort of the, the, the microaggressions that Black people face every day in this, you know, chronic um, mm -hmm. accumulation over time. And then you add these sort of acute stressors like violence um, mm -hmm. on top of that. Um, so uh, how, how, do we see, uh, how do we see the mental health community trying to, trying to approach this crisis on those levels? Right. So you, you touched upon the, the everyday exposure, right, to discrimination. Um, and, and whether it is at that micro level um, on a daily basis or a macro level, these have all been shown to impact various health outcomes. And when we think about, well, what health outcomes in particular, things like cardiovascular disease, things like mood disorders, sleep disturbance, eating behaviors, obesity, these are all just a few examples of what have been you know, shown. And when you combine that with the trauma associated with racial violence, then the effects are now compounded, right? Most recently, I read uh, an article from the Washington Post and they released a story regarding the current coronavirus pandemic and how it's pushing America into this mental health crisis as well. And the article cited that federal agencies and experts that they're warning that there's a wave of mental health problems that are approaching. And when you think about mental health problems, you have to think about things like depression, like substance abuse, like post-traumatic stress disorder, or even suicide. And given the disproportionate impact, right, of the coronavirus on people of color, the mental health strain is going to be even worse, right? And so while the Black community is facing the disproportionate impact of the coronavirus on their own communities, they're also now having to deal with the trauma associated with seeing, not imagining right. the killing of yet another unarmed black man found in George Floyd. And so that constant reminder of unequal justice and the imbalance in the view of how much a black life is worth, it's, it's slowly, sometimes for some people quickly, impacting um, the black community's mental health in ways that you know, our society just doesn't seem to understand. And we have to at first acknowledge that this exists so that then we can move forward with some, some solid change in being able to address these mental health issues. Yeah, that, 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 that's such an important point as, as to how, these, how all of these issues are linked together. Uh, one area of your research has really focused on cardiovascular health and some of the disparities between blacks and whites in different part of, parts of the country. Um, can you tell us about some of that research as kind of a practical application of some of these ideas that we've been talking about? Sure, this is, this is a great question. I'll, I'll first speak about the research side and then I'll talk a little bit about potential solutions, right? So most of my research involves trying to make sense of that intersection between health, space, and time. And so when I say health, a lot of what I am currently focusing on deals with cardiovascular health, as you mentioned. And the reason why cardiovascular health is very important in the line of work that I do is because cardiovascular disease, it's one of the number one killers in our country. And not only that, there are huge disparities that exist with respect to cardiovascular health between blacks and whites. So that's on the health side, right? The intersection of my work with respect to place comes in because I have a really strong interest in looking at the neighborhoods where people live in, right? And so I talked a bit already about neighborhoods and you want neighborhoods to be set up for success, right? And so if you live in a neighborhood that has access to the things that are going to then lead to a healthier lifestyle, that's a win. And so that's the health and that's the intersection with place. Where time comes in is when I'm looking at, are we making progress in this country, right, over the years, so that we can ensure that these disparities that we see in cardiovascular health, that they've actually declined. So one study 
that I recently led looked at the entire US as it relates to racial disparities between blacks and whites as it applies to cardiovascular health. And while the stroke belt, which for those of you who are not familiar, the stroke belt is located in the southeastern portion of the US. And unfortunately, in a number of states down there in the southeastern region of the US, they have larger incidences of stroke. And so while we knew that we would find disparities in cardiovascular health between blacks and whites in the stroke belt, we found it in other pockets of the US as well. We found large disparities in the Northeast where we're all situated right now, or at least the Franklin Institute is. Um, but then we've also found large disparities in the Great Lakes region, right? Going more towards the Midwest. And so the work that I'm doing, um, you know, highlights what these problems are, but then also so that we can have an eye towards what well, are there parts of the country where the disparities are slim to none? Because if there are parts of the country or pockets of the country where the, the disparities between cardiovascular health in blacks and whites is almost zero, we need to start looking at, well, what types of environments um, are there, right? What types of systems are in play in those pockets of the country? And so those are the problems. <laughs> um, the, the, that, that my research on that side, that deals with the problems, right? Um, in terms of the solutions, um, I always think about the American Heart Association and how it's almost a decade now that they came out with a campaign around what's called Life Simple 7. And Life Simple 7 is a way to ensure that you improve your cardiovascular health, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you have poor cardiovascular health, you're going to be more at risk for dealing with greater complications if you contract something like the coronavirus. Right. So the first step of Life Simple 7 is to manage your blood pressure. The second step is to control your cholesterol. The third step is to reduce your blood, your blood sugar. So those first three, those are often termed more on the biological side of the cardiovascular yeah. health structure sure. based right? on nutrition and, mm -hmm. and, and exercise it's like yeah and then the next four steps they're more on the behavioral like the modifiable side so the fourth one is getting more physically active mm -hmm. the fifth one is eating better the sixth one is to lose weight if you are in the overweight or obese category and then the final one is to stop smoking so these are seven things that the American Heart Association have, have tried to educate um, folks so that they have an understanding of what they can do, right? Um, but that's at the individual level, right? Remember, right. I subscribe to this notion of we can't just think about health at one level, right? So if you think about at the neighborhood level, we need to ensure that we provide environments where people can successfully um, be living their healthiest lives possible, right? So that means investing in neighborhoods to make sure that they're clean, that they're given the same access to quality education, that they include a number of, you know, healthy food outlets, um, and to ensure that they're safe. So if we think of solutions at multiple levels, then I think we can better posi position ourselves um, towards improving overall cardiovascular health. So when you look at some of these parts of the country where maybe the disparities aren't as big, um, do you see systems in place to address some of these you know, place-based issues? I do. I see more, so more pockets of the country where the disparities are not the greatest um, speak to having neighborhoods that are designed just like how I mentioned, where the, the access to fresh fruits and vegetables, it is at a fair, accessible um, grounding, right? Because it makes no sense to, you know, figure out, okay, well, let me just plop a Whole Foods in a particular neighborhood, but then it's not accessible for people, right? right? Uh, for the people that live in that neighborhood. Um, so there are more holistic approaches in mm -hmm. trying to educate folks and in trying to make sure that they're working with communities um, and not coming into the communities and telling them, this is what you need to do, um, but working with communities to say, well, what do you think you need most? 
Yeah, no, I think that's a really important point. And I, and I want to give a, a little shout out to some of the organizations here in Philadelphia that are trying to address those issues that, you know, that I learned about and talked to as we were working on the Heart Exhibit. You know, we talked to the Food Trust, which, you know, in Philadelphia is really setting a national model for how to get more fresh fruits and vegetables mm -hmm. into those corner stores, um, right. you know, in, in different neighborhoods. You know, we talked to community health centers that are combining mental health with physical health care um, to, to address smoking as a behavioral health issue. Exactly. Um, and you know, we talked with you know, so, some of the city planners in Philadelphia who, okay. as we're looking at you know, redeveloping neighborhoods that, you know, that have been historically flooded in, mm -hmm. in, in South Philadelphia, how do we take that kind of holistic approach to thinking about everything that a neighborhood needs in terms of access to green space and, and, exactly. and, and ways and places to exercise and things like that um, as we're thinking about designing the community. So um, I, it's, it's great to see those, that, that movement. Um, exactly. In that and that's what we need. That, that's exactly the types of partnerships that need to be in place so that not just a matter of thinking one dimensionally for solutions um, to addressing these different disparities. So as we think about, okay, we're, we're at this crossroads, it feels like, where I think that the COVID-19 pandemic has, has raised everybody's awareness of public health um, as, you know, as, a, as, a, as a field of science, as well as the direct impact that it has on our lives. Um, and I think you've really spoken to the necessity of bringing together people from different fields. Um, and so as we think about, you know, how science can play a role in, in these steps to move forward, um, where do you see a role for scientists? Yeah, so let me first say that, you know, while we are battling this global pandemic, there has clearly been a surge um, of people across the U.S. and internationally as well, where people are purposefully finding their voice, right? They are marching, they are protesting, many in mass, right? Yes, always um, good to see. It, always good to see. <laughs> um, and to me, this speaks volumes because people, many of which are very young too, um, which is, it gives me hope. Um, people are fed up. They're fed up with these rig systems and these rules that are in place to systematically oppress Blacks and other folks of color. And when you speak about science and what role there is for science during you know, these now national conversations that we're all having, it's, a, it's really important to keep a few things in mind. Not only is science fundamental in us fully understanding how to combat this global pandemic, but it's also necessary so that we can shine a light on the disproportionate impact, right, of this virus on the black and brown communities. So without science, oftentimes people rely on fake news, right? Or even scare tactics that yeah, are- we've been talking about that too. Mass, right, <laughs> sometimes mass as news. And so the goal of science is to be systematic. It's to be organized, it's to be rigorous, it's to be thorough. And without science, it's really difficult to, to even gauge the policies that are in place, right? The structures that exist and how they even impact the very citizens that they're intended to influence. So I know for me, in looking at some of the protests, I'm encouraged to see something as simple as a mask because that came from science, right? That at the very core, um, but on another hand, I then get discouraged when we, you know, see some of this footage that we're that we're witnessing, um, some of the policing practices, um, mm -hmm. and 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 how you know police are oftentimes arresting, say, even peaceful protesters, and then confining them to small spaces for a long period of time. Um, so there's a disconnect there, right? Because we know that we're in a global pandemic, right? Right. And so we, as a society, I think we need to balance the need to have our voices heard during this crucial moment in our country's history, right? We're living through this, but then also take heed to the science behind this most recent pandemic. Um, 
and a, and a colleague of mine, Lisa Boleg, she is a social psychologist and a, and a professor um, at George Washington University. She wrote an editorial on COVID and the first line spoke to, quote, we are not all in this together, okay? Um, and the reason why she said that, um, and I believe this too, as much as we would all like to think that we're battling these two public health crises together as a nation, and the two being say COVID and racism, it's also important to be realistic. Yeah. It's important to listen to the science and not make anecdotal judgments because that's leading to people actually losing their lives. So science at the core, it helps me though to remain hopeful, right? right. That we will get to the other side of both of these public health crises. And I'm convinced this is going to happen during my lifetime, <laughs> um, but we have to do it together, right? We yeah. can't expect those in medicine and public health to be the only ones buying into the science, right? right. We can't expect that. And then similarly, we in the black community, we cannot fight this battle of racism alone. Allies need to stand up. Those who are comfortable need to get a little uncomfortable, right? And help mm -hmm. with fixing these broken systems. And we can do this, but we have to be united to be able to move forward. And I think that's an important point as we think about where science and scientists play a role at the intersection of those two, because I think what history has shown us is that even though science likes to think that we're always, you know, systematic mm -hmm. and, and rational, that sometimes we are blinded by our own bias. Um, and that's, you know, part of the movement that we're in today is to make sure that we're all taking a step back as well to make sure that, you know, we are truly being systematic and, and, and logical and, and thinking about how we communicate that out because we haven't always done that. I also wanted to talk about, you know, thinking as about diversity in science um, and public health in particular, because it's a field that's so you know, intimately tied to communities. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things you know, that you talked, you, you touched on just now in terms of, you know, communication and, and partnership between science and different communities. You know, why is it so important uh, in public health um, to have diverse scientists at the table? And what can we learn from that in terms of, of, of other fields of science as well? Right. Diversity matters on so many different levels, right? If we lack diversity in the field of science, in public health research, in policy, which we do, right? Think about it. What is this saying to our children? What does this say to the next generation of potential scientists and researchers and policy change agents? And I, I mean, I know what that screams. It screams, you don't belong in this space, right? Because then when you look at the layout of the space, it doesn't necessarily represent, um, you know, someone that looks like me. And so if we really truly care about having a diverse field, found in science, we need to take a hard look at how we are supporting training programs, right? For individuals from underrepresented groups. We need to think more holistically about how to attract students, how to support these students, how to ensure that these students succeed as scientists or public health researchers in training. And then it doesn't stop there, right? Because then those that are trained we need to also still realize that we have to give them some support because this is not going to change overnight, right? right? And so I know for me personally, during my time at Drexel, I, as a faculty member, I participated in a program that was sponsored by the National Institutes of Health. And it was specifically through their National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute. And the program was called PRIDE. And PRIDE stood for Programs to Increase Diversity Among Individuals Engaged in Health-Related Research. And the whole purpose of this PRIDE program was to address and acknowledge the difficulties experienced by junior investigators and faculty and how those investigators and faculty need to establish independence in an academic career. And not only that, trying to figure out how to negotiate through the academic rankings, right? And so the primary outcome of the program was to increase the number of scientists and those 
um, that are research oriented faculty who are from backgrounds currently underrepresented in the biomedical sciences and those with disabilities. And it's preparing them for that independence. So for me, participating in that program was pivotal and it introduced me to a network of scientists, some of color, who offered priceless advice, right? And, yeah. and offered that structure that I needed to help me navigate throughout my academic career. And then immediately after participating in this program, I earned tenure at Drexel, which needless to say was a challenge, right? In and of itself. But programs like that, we need more of them. They, they are needed to ensure that if we really do care about having a diverse field found in science and public health and even policy, we need to put our money where our mouth is. No, that, that's a great example of, you know, the types of programs that can make a real concrete impact. You know, the other, as you were talking, the other, the other thing that I was thinking about was um, I was on a panel with um, a, a scientist once who talked about the fact, you know, when we were talking, we were all talking about kind of, you know, where we get our inspiration from. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she said that, you know, I solve the problems that annoy me. Right. Mm -hmm. right? And that really stuck with me because, you know, science, people get into science to try and solve those personal problems um, mm -hmm. that, that come from their life experience, that come from their communities. Right. And without having that, you know, that diverse representation from people coming from different communities, we miss those opportunities to solve right. those problems. Right. And to me, public health is, is one of those fields where that's just so crucial. Exactly, exactly. So, before we wrap up, um, we know that people are interested in following your work. Yeah. <laughs> What's the best way for people to keep track of, of what you're working on? Is it your website? Is it your Twitter or other social media? Um, so you can definitely visit my site at Drexel University. And we can um, follow up with a link to that in the right. comments. And then also I do engage in Twitter a bit. Um, my Twitter handle is tab Lonnie. Um, and you know what? I am always open to also having folks just simply email me. My email address is Lonnie at Drexel.edu, L-O-N-I at Drexel.edu. And I'm happy to engage, to share, um, because I know that oftentimes, you know, folks may, may conduct research and, and it's for the good but oftentimes it's hard to be able to kind of get that out of there, right? Get that out of the academic wall so that people can understand um, how to move forward with respect to certain issues. And so I'm always open to engaging in conversation with folks. Lonnie, thank you so much for being so generous with your time, your energy and your expertise. Uh, we really appreciate every opportunity we, we have to work with you. No, um, thank you. Looking forward to the next one. <laughs> yes. Yes, for sure. Thank you again for joining us today. Uh, be well. <laughs> Thank you. Take care, everybody. And our next conversation will happen again, back to our usual schedule on Monday. So um, I look forward to having you join me for another conversation next week. Thanks okay. a lot, everybody. Already. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.